I guess anyone's wondering. I was I was voluntold to do this. So <laughs> you, you're gonna get what you pay for. I didn't, uh, I didn't tell you I sniped you into writing a library for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> As I was saying, you're all going to get what you pay for. So this talk is about using Postgres views inside of Ecto. This is Elixir Toronto. It is March, and my name is Matt Spaceman. So who am I? Or actually, Gianni had a very good introduction, and I'm just going to be a lot more resume-based. But uh, So I, I helped set up tech at a Toronto nonprofit called The Bike Brigade, and I just pulled down some stats. So we started, The Bike Brigade started at the start of the pandemic, and we have volunteer cyclists that deliver food and supplies to people, usually like on behalf of mutual aid groups and food banks and the like. So since the start of the pandemic, we've had 735 riders ride over 81,000 kilometers, and we've done like 50,000 meals and 23,000 food hampers and a bunch more stuff. And all of it is kind of like logistic organized with an Elixir Phoenix app. So the examples that I'm going to give are through that. And also I'm now the co-founder at something called OneRG Labs, which is a community space and a consultancy that a friend and I started to try to bring to the other people that are interested in this like intersection of tech and social impact, and also try to do more work in that space. Some of it may be even paid. And that is my email. So what is this talk about? I'm going to show you this neat trick. I am not going to promise this is a good idea. But I want to show you how to do something that I've not seen done before. I got sniped into doing a library. And someone once told me that like every talk you give, you need to give people three things to take away. So I'm going to give you a call to action at the end. So a view, does anyone, how many people here are familiar with like database views as a, as a concept? I'm seeing, I think, yeah, 70, 70 to 80% not. So a view is like turning a query into a virtual table. So you save a query to your database. And then you could use it as if it was a table. And what's cool about views is normally they're like dynamic, they're kind of computed inside of your query, but they can also be, the word is materialized, but it just means like saved. And when it's saved, you could have indexes on them. So this is our like hello world view. We're going to create this view called my cool view, and it's just going to select star from foo joined with bar. And then we can just use it as a table. And we also can create a materialized view, which we say create materialized view, kind of the same stuff. And then now it's safe. Like it's not going to get updated as the values of foo and bar change, but you can always refresh it. And you can also refresh it concurrently, which will not lock reads. This is the Postgres syntax. I think other databases have similar stuff. So why do we want to use this? And I'm going to show you like three things that we do with views inside of the Bike Brigade app. The first one is stats. So this is a rider. I think this is me. So I've delivered 123 times for 74 campaigns. A campaign is kind of like a delivery for a given food bank would be a campaign. And I've done, I really need to get on my bike because like 350 kilometers is so much better than 348.4. So one day. And I want to create this stats table. And I think like the key insight here is that a view, you can just treat it like a table. So you can just give it an Ecto schema and use these views in your app as if they were tables. So this is my writer stats. This is my writer stats view table. And it's just going to have a count of tasks, which is the count of deliveries. It's going to have a total distance and a count of these campaigns. And there's going to be an association with the writer. You'll also notice that I think a question about this came up in the last talk. Here we don't have a primary key. We say there's no primary key because the view will not have a primary key. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have one. It's just created from other tables. So I need to like give you a little bit of schema context in order for this stuff to make sense. So I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. So we're going to have a table of locations. As you can see, this is just like an address, a city, a postal. And this last field in there is coordinates, which is, we're also using PostGIS. So this is just like a geographic point. And then we can do some fun PostGIS stuff to like measure distances. That's how I know how far you go. This is our delivery. So there's going to be an association with a campaign. There's going to be an association with the rider that did that delivery. And then we're going to have two locations. There's where you pick the thing up and where you dropped it off. We also have a campaign. So that's going to have kind of like a start and an end. So you can imagine uh, 60 riders are going to sh show up to like Parkdale Community Food Bank at like 
10 a.m. on a Tuesday. They're all going to be done by 11. And there's going to be like 17 different deliveries. Those would be the tasks. We have a association with riders through a join table. So that's those, those last two lines is how we have a many to many and also store some metadata on that join table. And then we have our riders. Much like humans, riders have names. They also have emails. And then we have a couple associations. So riders are going to be assigned some deliveries. We're going to have this the other direction of our many to many through the campaign rider join table. We're going to have many campaigns. Okay. That was all the pre work to show you this like big mess of SQL. And this is how we generate the stats. So I find SQL can be like hard to read when you first see it because there's a lot of text, but this is pretty like if you read it from the inside out, it's pretty easy to see what we're doing here. So we're going to kind of starting from the tables, like we're, we're joining our tasks to our campaigns to our locations twice, because we need to join to our pickup location, drop off location. And then we're just gonna select the rider ID. We're gonna count the tasks. We're gonna sum up all of the distances. And you see there's this ST distance function in there is the, that's the post GIS function that given two points tells you how far away they are. If you're, if you're like thinking about this, we are kind of cheating on the distance. This is purely as the crow flies. So if I told you that we wrote 80,000 kilometers, it's actually probably more because we're riding on streets, not as the crow would between two points. And we're going to take these counts and we're going to build this, this table and we're going to group it all by assigned rider ID. So you have for each rider, you have their stats. And that's it. So all I can, all I have to do is add a, a has one or relationship to our riders. And now I can just preload stats and I get access to this stats object as if I had a table. And then what's cool is I could make it a table. Stats is a very natural thing to want to materialize because some of these computations can be expensive. So if you have a, like a large enough data set where you actually want to cache the stats, you can, you can just switch this to be a materialized view. I think this is not the best example because these queries, these are, these kind of queries could also live inside of your like Ecto and your, your, your modules. But I think starting here opens up to more interesting examples. So the next one that I have is I'm going to call this like a virtual join where I don't want an aggregate stat. I want something else. And in this case, this is me. And for my location, I want to show you the neighborhood. So I know where people live. Like I have their address, but I want to, for, for, for me looking at this list, it's nice to know that I live in Roncesvalles. Technically I live in Sororan, but this is going to. So we go to the internet and we download a file, which is published by like the Toronto Open Data, which is just a list of all the neighborhoods and their geometries. So you get these like kind of polygons that represent every single neighborhood in Toronto. And I have a location and I can write a query to figure out which of these polygons it's in. But really what I want to do is I just want to like join to a neighborhood's table that will just like let me query my neighborhood. So let's do that. This is what our join is going to look like. This is actually simpler than the stats. So we're going to select our locations from our locations table, and we're going to do a join on our neighborhood. And we can just write this like fancy SQL where our join condition is something called SD covers, which is a PostGIS function that says, find me the thing that is covered by this polygon. And so now we just use that left join to combine our neighborhoods with our locations and that's it. And now I, all of my locations have a, a has one for a neighborhood and I can always give it a location, just like preload its neighborhood and see where it is. I have one more example, which is when things get more complicated. Uh, so this is Tyler and Tyler is a volunteer with the bike brigade and works on the app and also helps do deliveries. Most recently he delivered for something called lighthouse on February 8th. And that's actually a very hard thing to do if you think about it. Like you have a list of users and you want to find, you want to join to the most recent thing that they have an association with. You generally, like sometimes you might just like pull everything into your, into your app and sort it. It's like very hard to do that sort inside of SQL. That's yes, hard. It's hard because window functions every time I have to write one, that's like an hour of my life reading Julie Evans zines. And then I like kind of get it. And so I'm going to write it once and stick it in a .sql file and it's going to be a view. But yeah, so this is the schema is we have an association with a writer and association with a campaign. And then yes, in fact, we wrote a window function, which is annoying to do whether it's in Ecto or in SQL. But in this case, I'm not going to explain window functions right now. They are 
Oh God. Window functions let you solve this problem is how I would say. Window function is the thing that you need when I want to like join to something and then sort it and then pick the first one. That is like the hello world. This is the hello world of window functions. And I don't know why it's so long, but I can do this like fancy logic in a SQL file. And with that, we have what we want and our writer has a latest campaign. And for every writer, I could just say, join it to the latest campaign, give me the latest campaign. So why don't people do this? Like, this is kind of weird and you've probably not seen views as many views in Phoenix apps. I think there's three reasons. The first one is where do you put the SQL files? Like, I think that what's like great about frameworks is that frameworks tell you where to put stuff and it's like not obvious where to store the SQL. And it, like, is it in your migrations? And then you have like your database logic in your migrations. Is it somewhere else? And then if you do have a migration, how does it interact with that? And then like the third reason is that maybe this is overkill and you could do this all with Ecto queries. I've tried. I found that the ways of expressing, especially the neighborhood stuff, the ways that I ended up writing them in queries were not as expressive. But I think that there are, like, I would love somebody to come up to me after and show me how they do something like that window function for finding the latest thing for every single user inside of like pure Ecto without these like new tricks. So I guess I'll the first, the third one, but I did ship a small library. There's a typo. It should be Ecto underscore view underscore migrations. I'll drop the link in the Slack. But basically it's a migration generator that just gives you migrations that support views. So instead of one file, it's going to generate you a SQL file and a migration that migrates a SQL file. You edit the SQL file yourself. The file is like timestamped. And then it's smart about, the reason that migrations are hard in this case is that what does it mean to roll back creating a view? Like if that view doesn't exist, we need to delete it. If that view does exist, we kind of want to go back to the previous version and it handles all that for you. So it's going to date stamp your, your SQL files. And then if there is one to roll back to, it'll roll back to it. Otherwise it'll drop it. And then it also tells you where to put your files in the SQL, SQL directory. Okay. That was that. I promised you a call to action. This is the correct link to the library. I think you should try putting views in your, in your Phoenix app and see like if they help solve problems that are kind of hard to do with pure Ecto. I think that you should, if you're into riding your bike or riding or riding Elixir, come check out the Bike Brigade. We love volunteers. And also, so I started, I think last month we started a consultancy. Talk to me about, about hiring me. That was my <laughs> price. That was my price for doing this talk. So we primarily do like fractional CTO and data focusing for nonprofits. This doesn't apply as much here, but like we're young. So we're in, willing to do a lot of interesting, cool things. Are there any questions? And Thank you, Max. Thank you. Any questions for Max? Awesome talk. I'm super into views. So, you know. <laughs> I knew you'd like views. Yeah, you know yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. this is right up my alley. Um, Actually, lateral join books file just like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. didn't see any lateral join. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. I. I we did a cross join in some of our data science work last week. And I was like, damn, it's a cross join for real. Oh, I, did. I never use cross joins. Yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> you need to make data science fun. But so, you know, one of the things, obviously, I love using views. One of the things that makes me nervous mm -hmm. in Ecto is that I don't know how to stop it from allowing someone to attempt to write the view. And the fact that modern Postgres has writable views, like if you, if depending on the, how complicated your view is, you can actually end up with a view that will accept an update or a delete. And I, I've never figured out how to stop Ecto from letting a developer attempt to write against, because it doesn't know, know that that view, right? Mm. And so all that to say, like, obviously, if you don't have a million- I did not know that writable views existed. They're like uh, Postgres 11 plus. So do you have to say that the view is writable? I don't think so. You, you, it's basically that if, if the view is simpler, it will make it into a writable view. And if it's too complicated, then you have to you have to go out of your way to hand write how the updates should work. But if it's simple enough, it'll just like magically go poop now without your views writable. And then a developer could yeah. delete one of your neighborhoods and who knows what would happen, right? Yeah, that's really interesting. I feel like it should be possible to mark a table as not writable. It should just because like so much of Ecto is so well defined in these like keywords. Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel like there's something that you'd have to overload, but you could have a read only repo, yes. You could just to find a separate repo. Yeah, but that's that's hard because you want to you're joining across repos. The whole point here is to join 
with your actual tables and joining across repos is yeah hard. So I know I'm being a little academic, right? No, I think like, that's a, that's an interesting point. I didn't know there were writable views. So well, it's just like the reality is every view you showed was too complicated to be writable. So it's yeah. like in practice, I mean also like in your better. context, like if you're writing Phoenix apps like as you're supposed to, you probably have a context with all of your like update functions mm -hmm. like you're developing like, like you're not really calling repo.update mm -hmm. on random stuff right you're probably calling like you yeah, know so humans you dot new human and that's like wrapped for you yeah 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 okay well, that, that's cool like and i'm not trying to explain it I mean, yeah. honestly it's like it never comes up it's just a Tyler do you want to unmute I see you have a hello sure. yes can, can you hear me yep Awesome. Max, I was wondering, well, first of all, this is great. And I confess that I am a pretty big Postgres noob and I haven't done much stuff with Windows and even less stuff with views. I was wondering if you could just go back to the second example and highlight why that was a good use case for this. Because I didn't, because like you said, it is pretty simple. So is, is the thought here that this query is actually really expensive and that's why it was nice to make it into a view or is it some other reason that makes this a good candidate for a view? You mean this, this, this neighborhood example? Yes. And also, I don't know much about the GIS thing you're talking about either. <laughs> so maybe that's yeah, part of the reason. I think that, so your alternative to doing it as a view is like, you can have a where condition on your association, or you could just like have some function like in your, like in our locations module would have some function like get, get neighborhood. And what I want to do is I want to have a list of locations, right? And then join them and get all the neighborhoods. So that seemed like a natural use for like a join and a preload because that that sort of aggregation logic is done for me. I think your alternative might be like aware on the association, which I find they just added the ability to put fragments in there in the past, let's say six months which is the only way that I would be able to do this, this GIS thing. So I think the reason that, like this might not be a good idea, especially now that you could do fragments inside of like your filters on associations, but I couldn't at the time. And this seemed to be like the only way to have an association like that. Cool, no, that, that makes sense. Thanks for the explanation. Yeah, this is more evidence that I don't know if this is the best way to do this, but I want other people to try. Anybody else? Okay. Johnny? So just a, a point of clarification, this library that you created, it happens during the action happens during the migration process? It's just a generator. It's just it's just a new generator that generates a migration with a little boilerplate to load SQL for you. So and they're all books. Yeah, so it just it just generates this code is what's generated for you, okay. and then an empty file, and it just it just looks at the directory to see like do I have anything to roll back to, right. and generates it. So the reason the reason sorry. I ask this so that in the context that it releases, mm -hmm. if there's an extra step that you need to do before you close the release, or if it's just happens that you've already taken care of. You know, this is this would be the same generator that like like you could you could write this code like you could copy and paste this migration or like write it by hand and you would get the same the same effect it just like generates it for you cool yeah chris yeah that, this actually kind of answers my question i was kind of interested in the mechanism for rolling back and and the only comment i wanted to make is it seems like this is broader than just uh, it's, it applies to more than just views and mm -hmm. it's like any kind of sequel it seems like yeah yeah i think I, I i that's a good point i think that i like i created this for this problem but it might have the wrong name because it is it is kind of agnostic so in that it it generates drop view like it generates the text drop view but it should be agnostic to that and like like if you have like a bit of sql that you're loading in that you might change or you might delete it's kind of fun not to handle that so yeah that's what we use if you if you have a use for it like pull requests are very welcome like if there's a use that you have that needs a slight change i think it would be great to get this more useful yep. so can you said uh, use the automatic Yes. So sort of database views will like they never get like there's materialized views and then there's kind of base non-materialized views. And a non-materialized view gets automatically updated. It's not stored, it's just like a query 
like it's it's just a query that's transparently being forced to the table. A materialized view, you have to actually trigger the update. And do you have triggers in the data? I mean, sir, one That's how some people do it, or some people do it overnight. I gave you our stats, which should probably like give you a hint at how small the database is. I don't really need a materialized view like at our at that size. It's like you know a couple of megabytes. Okay. And I think that was it. So thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Yeah.